I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, November 27th. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday afternoons. If you have a question, write it up. We'd be happy to answer. Reply. There's a lot of technical detail here, and it's real easy to get lost in all of it. So uh, it's not surprising if you might have questions. All right, let's get to work. Looking at insignificant wave heights from the North Pacific Ocean, we don't see a whole lot going on at the moment. Remnants of a gale near the dateline, still producing 18-foot seas, aimed off to the southeast, targeting Hawaii and the U.S. west coast. Perhaps another gale is trying to develop off of Japan. Let's get into the details. We start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds of about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet to the south, just like right here. And what that typically does is help create a counterclockwise flow aloft, like an eddy, and also down at the ocean surface. And that is the hallmark of low pressure. Low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, as they get traction on the ocean surface, and if they're strong enough, generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell. Swell one hits your beach, turns into surf. So we have a little trough right here, but it's pretty pinched. Probably not great for getting circulation going both aloft and down the ocean surface. So we're kind of writing that off. The jet is pushing off Japan. It's kind of fragmented or almost split. One pocket here, one pocket here. They kind of come together here on the dateline. Then the jet splits again with a little bit of energy racing off to the east, but most energy pushing hard north up into the Bering Sea and then pushing down down or just off, we'll say, the uh, Canadian coast in British Columbia uh, into the Pacific Northwest. So we get into Monday, the, 12th, the 28th of November, pretty much the same sort of thing happens. But then as we get into Tuesday, a new trough starts developing on the dateline. It's really interesting. All the activity is on the dateline and not a whole lot east of there. There's a reason for that, and we'll get into that in a minute. But anyway, next trough develops on Tuesday into Wednesday, kind of falls apart, then redevelops a little bit more. Uh, again, supportive of gale development, but then as we get into Thursday, look at the jet. Most energy rate, I mean, it's heavily split with most energy racing way up into the northern Bering Sea and then down somewhere over or off of Canada with this trough here not really doing anything. In fact, when you get this split flow like this, you typically get high pressure in between the split streams. That does nothing. Notice a big ridge here north of Hawaii, again, supportive of high pressure. Maybe a little bit of a trough on Thursday, December 1st, off the Pacific Northwest coast. And then that trying to organize better as we get into Friday. Also notice winds start building off Japan on Friday as well, but really no troughs at in the immediate future right there. Anyway, backdoor trough pushing down the U.S. West Coast. I think we all know what the backdoor trough thing does. Typically, it brings in cold air down the coast, doesn't do a whole lot for swell development, and brings some precipitation, but with the very cold air, it's good for snow production. Not heavy snow, but at least some snow. As we get into Sunday, we're out, of, out almost a week now. Again, winds very strong, consolidated, pushing off Japan to the dateline, but at no real trough organized or forecast as of just yet. Let's go take a look down at the uh, the surface, ocean surface. So here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds. We know there's a bit of a trough right here, and there is a gale with 30, 40, almost 45 knot winds trying to get organized. You can see it as we get into Monday. Better organized, almost 50 knot winds, but over a very small concentrated area. And then as we get into Monday night, the, it builds in earnest with 55 knot northwest winds, almost maybe near 60 knots at one point there, holding into Tuesday, and then 
fading notice not really moving to the east just stationary in this area that's actually good the longer you have winds blowing over the same ocean surface the better they get traction there and the better they are at producing seas and therefore swell anyway so again to wednesday that gale starts fading out notice the backdoor front off the u.s west coast producing some wind probably more weather than anything Nothing in the Gulf or or out here in the uh, greater North Pacific. As we get into Thursday and Friday, another gale. Here we go, off the U.S. West Coast. Again, a weather producer. A gale trying to organize off Japan. We know the winds in the jet are pretty strong here. No clear trough set up. But as we get into Saturday, apparently there's just enough wind energy that in and of itself without a well-defined trough get us 55 knot winds out of the west, that would be good. Pushing north over the north dateline region, not there for a whole lot of time, not getting a whole lot of traction on the ocean surface. Another little gale tries to organize, but it too gets shunted off to the north. High pressure building over the U.S. west coast Sunday night. That would be December 4th. So what are the effects of those winds on the ocean surface? So we're going to go back in time just a little bit. We're on Wednesday, November 23rd, the day before Thanksgiving. There was a gale out here at the Dateline. You can just see it. It's like a machine. Everything's on the Dateline, but nowhere east of there. It lifted pretty much off to the north and northeast. There is some swell that's been generated, and it's pushing towards the U.S. West Coast. This low off of Hawaii, this is on Friday, what was that, two days ago? Swell from this system already impacting the Hawaiian Islands. And then as we get into, this was Saturday a day ago, yet another gale developed off the, uh, we'll say the Kuril Islands, falling southeast, yet some more swell generated targeting the Hawaiian Islands. All right, let's go. Now, this is what has happened. Hindcast data. Let's go look at the forecast. All right, now looking forward, here we are, uh, Monday, small gale developing. We know it is. Seas 28 feet starting to build, possibly up to 39 feet, and I think a little bit more. There we go. 47 foot seas as we get into Tuesday, the 29th of November. This is that gale that's stationary or forecast to be stationary over the dateline. This should do pretty well for generating swell for the Hawaiian Islands and the U.S. West Coast. But notice it is a long ways. It's a four-day travel time to the U.S. West Coast, about half that to Hawaii. So given the longer travel time, well, you'll get more swell decay and less size. Anyway, pretty nice looking gale nonetheless. It starts fading out as we get into Wednesday. And then here comes the system pushing down from the north along the U.S. west coast on Wednesday and Thursday with like 20, well, we'll go back here and actually look. Yeah, about 26 foot seas, 27 foot seas. The highest seas over this whole domain identified right there. And then that falls south Thursday and fades on Friday. Another system develops over the North Dateline region, supposedly, as we get into Saturday, December 3rd, with 39-foot seas, building to 40 feet later in the day Saturday, but then bound for the Bering Sea. Still, some swell could result from that. And yet, one more little system pretty much totally obscured or shadowed by the Aleutian Islands relative to the U.S. West Coast, and really nothing aimed at Hawaii. And that's it for now. Looking at local winds, the forecast for winds, well, we see low pressure, a cutoff low circulating north of Hawaii. The good news is it looks like the northeast winds that were in control are fading, light trades developing for the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, north wind, weak north wind pattern for California, but that is expected to build as we get into Monday. Pretty much a blowout. Northwest winds, 15 to 20 knots, the whole way down to Point Conception. Light wind pattern holding for the Hawaiian Islands. Tuesday, some variation of the same thing relative to California. A, almost a southeast wind pattern for the Hawaiian Islands, but pretty light. Wednesday, here comes the next low, theoretically pushing down the U.S. west coast, south winds into uh, the Golden Gate before sunrise on Thursday, and then pushing further south than that, light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. So we get into Friday, high pressure, 
tries to build in behind the first low, but another low is right behind that, pushing down the coast. Trades still continue for the Hawaiian Islands. Here we are Saturday. South winds looks like pretty much of a mess. Surf-wise, maybe it will bring some precipitation. And then Sunday, the northwest west winds continue again. Light trades southeast almost, if you will, for the Hawaiian Islands, and then more of the same as we get into Monday, December 5th. Precipitation potential for California right here. That's what we're looking at. We're looking for the blue working its way down, or the whites and yellows, which would be snow, and dry for Monday, other than extreme North California, maybe some snow flurries for Monday evening for the Sierra, and then things dry out again. But a stronger system forecast pushing down California as we get into Thursday morning. This looks like a solid snow producer and rain producer. Let's see how far south that goes. Almost to, well, a whole way into Southern California with pretty heavy snow, though short-lived for the Sierra. And then maybe Yet another system behind that. Here we go. And this actually looks better than it did this morning for Saturday night, December 3rd, uh, over with rain, the whole for the whole state of California, snow for the Sierra. And then where are we? We're almost at the, here we go, the end of Sunday and into early Monday, and then things dry out. The snow forecast dashboard, uh, s total accumulation over the next 10 days, theoretically about 39 inches for Squaw Valley, that'd be Palisades, Tahoe, and Kirkwood getting about 33 inches, and Mammoth roughly 18 inches. So again, these are all being generated. You can see where the blue is here. That's where the actual precipitation is occurring. This is the accumulation. We're going to go back to Squaw here. So you can see the precipitation occurring mainly on December 1st and then another event on the evening of December 3rd. Um, so not too bad. The thing is, the models have been hyping this. We were supposed to be getting solid, a week ago, solid precipitation was supposed to start like tonight or tomorrow. That's all gone from the models. It pushes it all out now, now another, another three days and another, and then another bout almost a week out from now. So we'll see what really happens. The GFS model at least seems to be overhyping this. And then when it really happens, it's far less than what the models predict. But if we can get this, it would be great. Looking at snow levels, well, this is the base of Palisades Tahoe at about 6,200 feet. The summit up there at the top of Palisades or Granite Chief, about 9,000 feet, something like that. The reds are liquid precipitation. The blues and the whites are frozen precipitation. The gray is sleet. And you can see here, for the most part, the freezing level below the base as we get into uh, tomorrow. And then maybe on the 29th, peaking up above, up to mid-mountain, something like that. But after that, freezing levels pretty low, theoretically down to 500 feet or 1,000 feet, so very low, and then potentially building beyond that 10 days out on the model. We don't believe any of that. But for right now, cold air seems to be getting ready to move into California, courtesy of those backdoor troughs. Hopefully there is sufficient moisture with it as those troughs move through. All right, let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian oscillation? That's an oscillation that runs about six weeks over the Pacific. And then the El Nino Southern oscillation, which can run up to seven years over the Pacific. So as usual, we'll start with the MJO. We're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. There's two phases, active and inactive. The active phase is a low pressure system. The MJO moves from west to east around the planet on the equator. Active phase on one side of the planet, inactive phase on the other side. They rotate around west to east. When the active phase moves over into the West Pacific, what that does is it starts imparting energy to the jet stream. It can also dampen trade winds because it's low pressure. Low pressure, uh, uh, trade winds are driven a lot by high pressure. The stronger the pressure over the North and the South Pacific, the stronger the trades. Uh, that would be a La Nina situation. El Nino situation is when you have a predominance of the active phase of the MJO, low pressure, that reduces trade winds, and if anything, can reverse them at times. And that takes warm water that's over in the West Pacific and starts pushing it east 
under the equator in the form of a Kelvin wave. If you have successive active phases of the MJO, you can get successive Kelvin waves. Eventually, all that warm water starts erupting off of uh, the Galapagos and Ecuador. You get a warm water slick there, and that's what kicks off El Nino. All right, so right now, the arrows is what we're looking at. This is the West Pacific here, the East Pacific here, the equator right there, the date line, 180 West. And this is data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys that are strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. But we can also get teaser signs of the MJO. So we're just looking at the arrows. They, they tell us the wind speed and direction. The longer the arrow, the stronger the wind. So strong east trades in the east Pacific, strong east trades in the central Pacific, medium to strong east winds over the west Pacific. We call it the Kelvin wave generation area because this is where when the active phase moves over this area, if the trade winds get reversed, this is where you generate Kelvin waves. Once you get past about 170 west, then you're too far east and you won't get a Kelvin wave. It all has to happen in the West Pacific. But it's not the, the average wind speeds. That's what these are, five-day average. It's the anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. These strong uh, east winds, when well, you look at the arrows, their arrows are actually coming out of the west, suggests these winds are much weaker than normal, and you have kind of a... Uh, let's say active phase flow, you get over the central Pacific, trades weaker than normal too. They're still out of the east, a little bit stronger, but but not nearly as much as it has been for the past couple of years. And in the Kelvin wave generation area, yeah, winds are still out of the east, but not as bad as they have been. Not are capable really of generating a Kelvin wave yet, but certainly not nuking east trades that just uh, makes continuous upwelling. Let's go take a look at the forecast. So here we have some good news and the start of a lot of good news, we think. All right, this is the 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies, the east-west component of the wind, just like what we were looking at. The blues and the purples are easterly anomalies. That would be like the inactive phase of the MJO, if not La Nina. The reds and the yellows, westerly anomalies. Think of that as the active phase of the MJO. Now let's get ourselves positioned here. The date line is right there. It runs right up the middle of the chart. The far west Pacific starts at 135 east, so right there. Okay, Kelvin wave generation area, 135 east to 170 west. So right there. This is the area we're interested in terms of generating Kelvin waves. And then this is past performance. And if you've been watching these videos for months and years, as, as some of you I know have, it's been just the past two years, solid, hard purples and blues over the dateline in the Kelvin wave generation area for two years now. Notice back early November, we got a little softening of that, some westerly anomalies briefly built over the Kelvin wave generation area. Today, westerly anomalies on the whole way beyond the date line, almost completely filling the Kelvin wave generation area, if not the entire equatorial Pacific. And yes, easterly anomalies return as we get into maybe five, six days from now. But not particularly strong, not looking as solid with westerly anomalies trying to hold in this area. This, we think, is another sign of a beginning of the demise of La Nina in the Pacific, and is exactly what the models have been saying for months now, and we think it is happening. So let's look out two weeks. Outgoing long wave radiation, OLR. Fancy words for cloud cover. Let's get ourselves oriented here. This is a two-week forecast. Uh, each panel is five days today, five days from now, 10 days from now, 15 days from now. Uh, South America there, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, the date line, 180 west right there, the equator right there. We're interested in Kelvin wave production and westerly anomalies. That's in the Kelvin wave generation area. That'd be right here. The blues, more clouds than normal. The reds and yellows, less clouds than normal. If you get more clouds, it typically means low pressure. That would be the active phase of the MJO. This would be the inactive phase of the MJO. So active phase in the Kelvin wave generation area today, inactive phase in the Indian Ocean, the active phase fading five days from now, the inactive phase starting to work its way into the West Pacific 10 days from now, and then weak 
in the West Pacific two weeks from now. This per the statistic model. The dynamic model, not as bad, saying, yeah, active phase fading, but 10 days from now, no inactive phase. The inactive phase just dissipates, and if anything, a weak active phase sets up over the Kelvin wave generation area two weeks from now. Why is all this? Let's go dig just a little deeper. Phase diagrams, the same two models, statistic model and the dynamic model here, but this shows you exactly where the active phase is and how strong it is. So the MJO, how do you read these charts? The MJO moves from west to east over the Pacific or around the planet, from the Indian Ocean over the Maritime Continent, that's like Bali, to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is today, so it's in the East Pacific. The further that dot is away from this circle, the stronger it is. So actually not so bad. A moderate plus strength active phase in the East Pacific today. And per the statistic model, it says, well, it's going to make it to the Indian Ocean or maybe even still over Africa two weeks from now and very weak. The dynamic model, though, suggests that the active phase is to race off to the east and be somewhere very weak over the maritime continent two weeks from now. So that would dampen any, wherever this dot is or wherever these are, the opposite side of the circle is where the inactive phase would be. So this sort of suggests the inactive phase over in the far west Pacific two weeks from now, where this suggests, well, the inactive phase, if it's anywhere, might be over Africa or in the Indian Ocean. So the two models, a little bit not sure of what's going to happen two weeks from now. The GFS model going out two weeks, right? This is, again, the east-west component of the wind. Let's get ourselves oriented. The equator's right here. This is the Pacific Ocean. You can see the Galapagos right there. Ecuador is, like, right off here. Sa Central America and Mexico right there. Hawaii there. New Guinea there. We're looking for the oranges and reds in the Kelvin wave generation area, 5 degrees north to 5 degrees south over out to about 170 west, so right in there. Right now we see the blues are easterly anomalies, but very weak. Notice all these westerly anomalies over here off of, we'll call it the, the east and central Pacific. That's actually a good thing. Westerly anomalies, if they're not in the Kelvin wave generation area, they won't generate a Kelvin wave, but they will still prevent upwelling, and you end up with warming water temperatures, and we're going to see that in a minute. So this is actually a good development here. You see little bits of westerly anomalies trying to develop in the Kelvin wave generation area. So we put this into motion. The same basic pattern holds. Easterly anomalies try to get a little bit of a... Uh, toehold on things on Friday, December 2nd. We saw that in the other model, and they continue in some fashion, but then they start weakening again as we get into December 7th. Notice westerly anomalies in the far west Pacific developing, and they hold on right on the equator, almost there, giving up a little ground as we get into December 11th, but then I think there we go. As we get into December 13th, more westerly anomalies, again, off on the east, but in the Kelvin wave generation area, and we have maybe one more day there. So this is a much improved pattern compared to what we've been seeing for months now, where it's just steady nuking like these purple kind of colors right here. All that is gone now and not forecast to return. Next, we look at the upper level model. This is areas favorable for precipitation. It goes out 40 days. We have Five different or eight different panels, five days each panel. South America, Central America, New Guinea, the equator right there, Dateline roughly there, Kelvin wave generation area there. Now areas favorable for precipitation are greens, and this runs about this is in upper levels of the atmosphere, runs about a week ahead of what's going on at the surface. But this suggests that the greens, the active phase favorable for precipitation, is pushing out of the Pacific, and the inactive phase is in the Indian Ocean trying to work its way in. Now this is a statistic model. You see the inactive phase building across the Pacific, and then exiting maybe mid-December, something like that. And then the active phase, which is developing in the Indian Ocean, makes its way weekly over the uh, Pacific for the second half of December into at least early January. 
And next up is the CFS model going out one month right here. This is, again, the whole plan on one chart. Dateline runs right up the middle. Kelvin wave generation area, about 135 east, so right in this area right here. Now, you can see the, the blues are easterly anomalies. Think of that as inactive phase of the MJO or the La Nina signal. The reds and oranges are westerly anomalies. You can see they've been holed up over the maritime continent here, like Bali in that area, where easterly anomalies have been just locked over the dateline for two years now. This only goes back to September 3rd, but it's this is a repeat of what's been going on. But notice today, the 26th of uh, November, westerly anomalies over the Kelvin wave generation area. And you see westerly anomalies forecast holding, not making it to the dateline, but maybe, maybe two-thirds of the way to the dateline. This, the solid black line here, that's the active phase of the MJO, and it's moving over the Kelvin wave generation area, according to this model. It's forecast to produce westerly anomalies holding the whole way through mid-December, and then even after it fades in the westerly anomalies phase, yes, we have e uh, fade, we have easterly anomalies setting up, but still a neutral pattern. It's uh, continuing in the far west Kelvin wave generation area. This is exactly what the models were predicting months ago. And then finally, the CFS model going out three months. Now, past performance is down here. This is the forecast here starting end of November into February. And this is really no different than what we've been looking at for the past many, many weeks. The blue, oh, and let's get ourselves oriented. Kelvin wave generation area starting about 135 east over to 170 west, so here, and you can just take that the whole way up here. The real obvious thing is blues, easterly anomalies that were in control of the Kelvin wave generation area, starting today, they're all but gone or relegated just barely in the eastern quadrant of the Kelvin wave generation area, but westerly anomalies forecast to continue building over the Pacific Ocean, finally, finally, finally getting some traction. Now, we were talk, looking at the models before. All storm activity you saw was to the dateline and for the most part west of there. That is because these westerly anomalies are slowly inching their way into the Pacific for the first time in two years. We think that pattern is only going to build. And the further to the east these westerly anomalies build, the more they'll drag the storms or allow the storms to form not just in the far west Pacific, not limited to just the dateline, but eventually perhaps make it into the Gulf of Alaska. That will, that will bring the storm centers closer to the mainland in Hawaii, meaning larger surf, less swell decay, and also increasing the chances for precipitation down into the west coast of the United States and hopefully California, but that might be a bit of a reach. All right, that said, let's overlay the MJO here. Uh, the solid contours, this is the forecast up here. This is what's been going on. Solid contour, active phase of the MJO, dotted contours, inactive phase. The short of it is you can look here and just a very weak MJO pattern is forecast. You need really like three contours to be it, to have it be strong. So weak inactive pattern in control or forecast now into almost Christmas time. But notice westerly anomalies filling the West Pacific, and then only building more as the active phase pushes theoretically across the Pacific in Christmas time to oh, about uh, the end of January, and then westerly anomalies holding beyond that. Now let's overlay the low pass filter. This is even better. The dotted contour is a high pressure bias synonymous with La Nina. The dark contour here, the solid contour, is a low pressure bias. Again, the Kelvin wave generation area starts right about here. You can see the low pressure bias from here forward is only pushing its way off to the east. Notice the high pressure bias. It has two contours, but that second contour is supposed to be gone before we even get to Christmas. And as we get into later in January, it retreats completely out of the Kelvin wave generation area. Many of the model runs even have it completely dissipating from the Pacific. That suggests that low pressure, the bias, which has been holed up, we'll call this the El Nino signal, which has been holed up over the Indian Ocean for two years now, 
is finally going to start making progress into the Pacific, and high pressure that has been locking down the Pacific and preventing storm development, both in the summer and winter, looks like it's finally going to be fading. So we get by the end of January, we could be in a very good place. Next up, subsurface ocean temperatures in the Pacific, across the equatorial Pacific, just two degrees north and south of the equator, the whole way across the Pacific and down in the ocean. How do we get this data? Well, this is data from the TAA buoy array, that uh, the series of buoys used for monitoring El Nino. These are the anchor lines on the buoys. Someone very cleverly decided to stick some thermometers or temperature sensors on those anchor lines at various equidistant uh, locations down the lines. The short of it is you can get the profile of subsurface ocean temperatures. Why would, would you want that? Well, you can see Kelvin waves coming. It takes three months for them to make their way across the Pacific. You can see them coming three months ahead of time. Slow moving train wreck in a good direction, assuming that's happening. All right, so looking at data, well, so this is centigrade data. The 29 degree isotherm is not there. This is the 28 degree isotherm. It's at 175 east. That's about where it was last week, give or take a degree or two. The 26 degree isotherm at 155 west. That's pretty nudged off to the west. And the 24 degree isotherm at 135 west. At one point, it was up at 120. So this sort of suggests some upwelling thing is still going on and warm temperatures are shunted off in the West Pacific and colder temperatures are in the East Pacific. Now this is just the raw data. The interesting thing here is look at this. This version of the, the map of subsurface temperatures suggests, well I'll just say it, this looks like a Kelvin wave. It's steadily pushing east. It was at 150, something like that, so that'd be right about there, um, had been locked there or west of there for months. Now, all of a sudden, we see eastward progress. And cooler temperatures, well, they're not as cool as they were, and they seem to be moving off to the east, too. That is one version of reality. Now, there's this other model. It runs about a week behind. It's stuck on the 19th. It is showing much warmer temperatures in the west, much colder temperatures in the east. But even it is showing a finger of warm water trying to move off to the east, almost to 140 west. We think the next time this thing updates, which should be, well, maybe on Monday or something, that maybe all this will fill in with the oranges, the warmer temperatures. But that's just a guess. Sea surface height data, which that second model we just looked at, a lot of it is based on this. So this is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here. That's Chile, Peru, Galapagos right there, Central America, mainland, Hawaii there, Dateline, the equator. Um, now this is the height the sphere, the height of the sphere of the ocean, okay, take the waves out of it, take the wind waves, take the tides out, is the sphere higher or lower than normal? We're talking by centimeters, satellite-based data, very accurate, all right, so over here, 20 centimeters above normal, maybe 25 or 30, that means if you have warm water at depth, it expands, it'll create a bulge on the ocean surface. If you have cold water at depth, it contracts, you get a divot on the ocean surface. So using these height anomalies, you can infer what's going on down in the ocean. So this suggests a lot of warm water in the far west Pacific. Cold water, minus 15 centimeter anomalies uh, in the east Pacific on the equator. The dividing line, somewhere around 150 right there. Now, the question is, is this growing or shrinking, and is this pushing off to the east? This chart is not going to show you that, but the next one will. This is the best guess at what's going on, upper ocean heat anomalies, the upper 300 meters of the ocean surface. Kelvin waves travel from west to east down about 150 meters, so this captures all that. In fact, this is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here, time going back a year ago, uh, right around Thanksgiving 2021. Warm water pushing across the Pacific, that's a Kelvin wave. Cold water prior to that, this is the classic La Nina signal. We have a Kelvin wave, more cold water. This was back last spring in uh, June and July of this summer. We got one week Kelvin wave and then more cold water. Just the dominance of cold water 
is a clear sign of La Nina. But look at this. The look at the line here, the dividing line between the warm and the cold, steadily moving off to the east. We want to see this moving quicker. We still have this pretty good bolus of cold water right here at 120 west. But we think this is starting to move. And notice the amount of warm water here. And then you part or you know match that up with the models and what we're seeing is westerly anomalies building over the West Pacific and the low pressure bias trying to creep into the West Pacific suggests that all this is going to start moving off to the east at some point, wiping out this cold water. And once that happens, then we're on our way to returning to normal and no longer in La Nina. See surface temperature anomalies, okay? Much different pattern from what's going on down at depth. See this much colder than normal water off of, well, Ecuador is right there. The Galapagos are right, right there. Okay. But as we were talking about last week and the week before that, the cold water down here, which was much colder weeks ago, continues to slowly warm. And the cold water, yes, it's still there, but it's coverage of the deepest colder waters, not as big as it's been, suggesting maybe a change is underway. Nothing really giant, but a very subtle change. Let's dig into this a little more. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days. Now, last during the week last week, there's a lot of t t temperatures trending cooler, but about two days ago, boom, here we go. The warming starting to show up. Remember, we, we talked about Easterly anomalies and the trade winds starting to slack in this area and get weaker when that happens. Temperatures start warming, upwelling stops. Also notice again off of Chile and Peru, temperatures warming in all this broad area right in here. Not mega warming, it's very little and subtle, but little bits of that over a long period of time make a good big difference in helping to weaken La Nina. That's exactly what we think is going on. We think the underpinnings of La Nina are starting to fade, and it's all going to start collapsing here pretty soon. Again, the backed off view, South and Central America, Australia, New Guinea, the equator right there, cold temperatures right here, and the, yes, cold temperatures, but not as cold as they were over a much uh, well, it's still a broad area, but not as cold as it was over that broad area. And we think this is all slowly warming, going to collapse at some point in the relatively near future. See, see surface temperature anomalies, the trend in the Nino 1.2 region. This is the area right there up along the, the Galapagos and Ecuador. Uh, temperatures not really doing a whole lot right now. Still minus 1.666 degrees. The La Nina threshold is half a degree way up here. So still pretty cold. But this is where all that cold water at depth we think is upwelling to the surface, being squeezed gently by warmer temperatures in the west starting to push off to the east. Now, the trend in the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, this is the area from south of California on the equator out to about the dateline, looking much better. Temperatures rising steadily at minus 8.93 degrees. Uh, again, the La Nina threshold, half a degree. It's not even on the scale in this chart, but at least we're heading in the right direction. And then on this chart, upper ocean heat anomalies, again, this is just for the area from the dateline over to now, somewhere near Ecuador, or the Galapagos, uh, and uh, upper 300 meters of the ocean. You can see the trend. Cold water last year, our one Kelvin wave, and then in spring, more cold water. Our other Kelvin wave that, that was this summer, and then cold, cold, cold. But you see the hint, just a hint of temperatures trying to trend upward. All right, so what does the atmosphere think is going on? We've looked at the MJO thing, and it looks like MJO activity is slowly improving with westerly anomalies moving over the West Pacific. Down deep in the ocean, we see there's 
what looks to be maybe a very slow-moving Kelvin wave trying to make its way, well, a lot of warm water in the West Pacific, trying to make its way east, but no real strong active phase of the MJO to set up a legitimate Kelvin wave yet. Uh, at the surface, cold water is still in control, but the trend is maybe starting to warm. What's the atmosphere think is going on? So we look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, which is in the Indian Ocean, and Tahiti, which is in the uh, Pacific Ocean. When the index is negative, that means pressure is lower over Tahiti. When it's positive, it suggests pressure is higher over Tahiti, which would be the Pacific. Today's value, plus 10.05. But if you look back here, there is a definite softening trend. I mean, the numbers were, and it, you can't see it, there's only last four days left in this month here, but they've been consistently between 10 and we'll say 30. And all of a sudden, somewhere in November, it, we just started dropping and dropping, not deeply negative, not a strong, not indicative of a strong active phase of the MJO, but just a general softening in the trend. Maybe at a minimum, a weak active phase of the MJO, but we think this is directly attributable to those westerly anomalies starting to push over the West Pacific, because when you do that, what that effectively does is start lowering pressure, and that's showing up in this index. The 30-day average takes some of the noise out of all this, you know, the daily up and down, plus 4.18, well, what was it a month ago? 18.68, and you can just see it steadily going down. That is a very good sign. Now, the 90-day average still at 14.14, which is not a whole lot different than it was a month ago. But give it about another month, and if this trend continues, you're going to see this softening up too, heading more towards neutral. We think that is exactly what's going to happen. Here's a 30-day SOI graphed out so you can see the trend. Here is these downward spikes like that. That would be the active phase of the MJO, or at least lower pressure moving over the Pacific. Certainly, we've been on a good run here. The upward spikes are the inactive phase of the MJO, and you can see since, well, two years ago, what, January 2020, it was up, up, up. We got a little break, and then it was up, up, up some more. Now we're heading down. In fact, approaching, I don't even dare say it neutral, but we're hoping that's where we're going. We know the inactive phase of the MJO is probably going to set up here for a little bit, and this will probably rise some. But what we're looking for is the general long-term trend is for this to at least hit zero, neutral. And that would be neither El Nino nor La Nina. Anything is better than where we've been, which is in solidly in La Nina territory. Sea surface temperature projections for the Nino 3.4 region from the CFS version 2 model. Pretty much no change here from last week. Temperatures right now, one degree below normal. That's where they've been for like forever. And as we get to somewhere about mid-December, then the trend is supposed to start heading up. This is the raw data suggesting 0.65 of a degree in mid-January, and by the end of January, out of the La Nina thresh the threshold, half a degree below normal, so still below normal, but officially out of La Nina somewhere around late January, early February, trending upward to almost 0.75 of a degree above normal as we get into August. That would be El Nino territory. We're not going to say that's the case. We don't certainly don't believe a model going out that far. What is that, six months out? So we're just looking at this area right here. The trend continues in the right direction. PDF corrected version, even a little bit more optimistic. We're going to say the last week in January, we're out of La Nina and heading upward from there, notice this says barely El Nino uh, six months from now in uh, or more. What is that, August or something like that? August, that's probably nine months from now. Uh, either way, trending in the right direction. That's exactly what we want to see. So for right now, series of small gales have developed on the dateline in and of themselves. 
not super significant in terms of swell production. Certainly better for Hawaii than us just because Hawaii is closer. There's like this brick wall on the dateline right now, and nothing seems to be able to make it past that. But the fact that there is a brick wall and that the brick wall appears to be moving a little bit to the east, indicative of westerly anomalies, just like what the model has been saying, moving slowly into the Pacific and only forecast to build over the coming months, that suggests the storm track will improve short term wise a pretty solid storm is forecast in the next couple of days with 45 plus foot seas on the date lane date line aimed well to the east targeting hawaii and the u.s west coast so maybe some swell from that also on the positive side two backdoor cold fronts pushing south with theoretically three feet of snow for the tahoe region if it happens, the models have kind of been hyping this and then never delivering. So uh, we'll keep our eyes on it. We're not particularly uh, like going to hold our breath or anything on that. But long term, all the models saying no change from what we've been saying for weeks. The change is coming. If anything, the change is happening now. This is really good. Westerly anomalies building. We just need more of it covering more of the Pacific. And there's nothing to suggest that that isn't going to that isn't that trend isn't going to continue to happen. So we're cautiously optimistic that finally some sort of a real storm producing weather producing swell producing pattern is going to be setting up as we get closer to christmas and into january all right if you enjoyed the video give us a thumbs up we'd appreciate it uh, again like and subscribe and ring the bell you'll get the notifications when we post the videos if not go to stormsurf.com links to the video can be found at the top of every page on the site there stormsurf.com is where a lot of the charts that you've seen tonight uh, you can go uh, see them yourself, follow along during the week, and then check your knowledge with the video at the end of the week. All right, that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week, same time, same channel, and we'll see you then. Be safe.